This is where we live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Catherine Shen. When she was growing up as a teenager, New Haven writer Rachel Calder Nailbuff set out on a very personal oral history project, interviewing her family members about their periods. These stories from generations of women were published in a 2015 collection called My Little Red Book. Now, with our Red Book, Rachel has gathered an expanded collection of oral histories from people across the globe, different cultures and generations, culminating in what she calls a collective journey of growth and change. She joins us today to talk about what it was like to collect these intimate stories and to explore some of the stigma and misinformation about periods. And later on, some Connecticut contributors to the book tells us what it was like to share their story. Rachel joins us now. Thank you so much for joining us, Rachel. Thanks so much for having me. Um, Rachel, why did you want to collect these stories and what have you learned since publishing the book? Sure. Well, I want to say that I started this project as a teenager. Um, I'm 32 now, so I've been working on this for a long time, pretty much my entire adult life. And what's propelled me um, really began with hearing a single story when I had just gotten my first period. Um, I was 12 and my mom announced to my entire family, of course, that I had become a woman. (laughs) Um, And this I had thought at the time was the worst thing that anything that anyone could experience, um, the worst way to get a first period, um, even though it was totally well-intentioned. And my great aunt um, took me aside after this family gathering, it was a Passover Seder, and took me into her bedroom and told me a story that she had never told anyone else in my family, which is that she had gotten her first period while fleeing Nazi-occupied Poland on the journey itself. And it had actually happened at the German border where all of the women were told to get out of this train and they were, they were strip searched um, by SS officers and blood started trickling down her leg. And she was excused from the examination because the officer was so disgusted. And that was her first period. (laughs) I remember it at age 12, just thinking, Oh, my God, first, my story is nothing. (laughs) She was kind of doing one of those like, sit down, let me tell you something like this is not so bad stories. But also, it was a moment where I felt so immediately aware of the history that she had lived through in a way that I could not have comprehended at age 12. And in many ways, I think still um, this story as an adult tells me so much about um, the Holocaust, being Jewish, her family, that moment in time. And um, even though I was a kid and I didn't really have political vocabulary, I started wondering at that age, why don't we tell these stories? How is it that this woman has lived her whole life and never shared this account, um, this harrowing story, this incredible cultural artifact? um, And why is it that no other women in my family have told me their stories. And I shared this story with um, my mom who hadn't shared it either. And it sort of opened the floodgates, so to speak. Um, Everyone in my family immediately started archiving stories from each other. And um, part of the reason that this project has really continued is that talking about menstruation has this amazing effect where once you start talking, it immediately inspires someone else to share their story. And so I quickly found myself sort of on a trail, um, <laughs> gathering stories first in my own family and then more broadly. Um, and at the time, I was really thinking about first period stories. Um, but after a first collection of first period stories was published, that was called My Little Red Book. And that really took off. Um, I kept hearing stories from readers, readers who wanted stories from people across um, all ages. And as I got older, um, I started also realizing that the shame and the silence that's connected to a first period um, that I had experienced doesn't just end when you're a teenager, um, but trickles into the rest of your life. It trickles into intimacy, pregnancy, miscarriage, abortion, missing periods, 
heavy periods, irregular periods, transitioning genders and how that shifts your relationship to menstruation. Um, trauma and menstruation are so intimately linked. Menopause, I mean, every part of life um, has these important, rich stories and experiences and pains and joys um, and cultural practices. And yet so many of us remain in the dark about these until we experience them ourselves. Um, and so it felt evident to me pretty early on after I had published um, my little red book that there needed to be a book that held more kinds of stories. Um, also in the past 15 years, our relationship to gender has really changed um, culturally. And we also talk about menstruation significantly more. And so it felt like this book, we are finally ready for a book that really invites readers of all genders to join in in the conversation and to listen. Um, and so that's that's part of the hope of this of this project that we're really kind of at this next frontier where we are ready to talk about um, what happens to half of the world um, with everybody, with our partners, with our loved ones, with our classmates, with our family members. And so um, through a collection of stories, the hope is that um, everyone feels invited in. Well, and I love that, you know, we're here to talk about about personal stories and, and memory and stigma and misinformation. But I feel like you started out by telling us such a powerful story with your aunt, which thanks so much for sharing. And it there's so much good energy to talk about what what may not seem like a very normalized conversation yet. And so I wonder if that resonates with people um, that they're hearing this today. And you also say that we all have an emotional reaction or memory connecting us to menstruation. So in that case, you know, why do you think this is so stigmatized? It's it's such a good question. And that was, I think, really the driving force behind this project. Um, shame is so mysterious and I grew up in a fairly open household. And so I think for me, I was really confused about this from a young age. How could I feel shame? Um, and how could my great aunt who is allegedly quite open about everything also feel so much shame? Where does shame come from? And um, shame, I think what I've uncovered from working <laughs> in this shame filled terrain for my adult life is that it's a force that's bigger than any individual. It's a cultural force. It's bred in silence and in the void of conversation. And um, in a country that lacks basic sex education <laughs> um, and where still half of the room is often segregated and told to um, disappear for half an hour during the period talk, it makes sense that um, there's a lot of stigma just in the air that can be absorbed. And um, a lot of people absorb it from a very young age, even before school in a household where, um, you know, parents maybe, and, and this isn't necessarily their fault. It's just something that we've also absorbed across generations, don't know how to talk about their periods with their own kids. And so we'll hide their experience every month um, or shoo a kid away when they ask, like, what's that in the trash bin? <laughs> and little moments like that add up and tell a young person from a very early age, this is a forbidden subject. This is something that's not to be discussed. I think especially if you are a cis boy um, growing up in the US today, that's a lesson that's taught from an early age. Um, but it can also be taught in school um, by, yes, by not learning um, or from um, your classmates laughing at something and um, there's so much ostracization that happens before we become um, fully formed. And so we absorb that and it's, and it's in the air. Um, and I think part of why I wanted to gather stories from so many voices, there are almost 90 voices in this book is to shed light on people's 
experiences that aren't filled with shame so that we could really see what shame looks like. Um, one of my favorite pieces from the book comes from a contributor in Brazil named Claudia Pacheco, who talks about the experience of raising her infant son from the very beginning with this idea that um, she should talk about menstruation openly and from, you know, every kid pretty much naturally asks, where did I come from? How did I, <laughs> you know, how did I come into being? And she said, menstruation, my period was your life source. And um, for her, this also connects to her indigenous heritage, which views menstruation as a life source. And um, maybe this is a bit of an extreme example, but still I think important to learn from. She, um, has this practice of collecting her own menstrual blood and watering plants in her yard because in her um from her cultural tradition menstruation is is viewed as nourishment and um and it makes sense and so she and her son actually water plants in her yard with her menstrual blood and her young boy views this jar of blood every month is this exciting opportunity to water the plants in their backyard. And this is so far from the way that I grew up in <laughs> New Haven, Connecticut. But once I heard the story, I thought, this makes so much sense. And um, yet we are so, so far from it. Um, and how it how is this possible? And it kind of pops the balloon. It exposes shame for what it is and how it operates. Um, there's another essay in this book that I think does a really good job of that, which is um, a reprint of an essay by Gloria Steinem called um, If Men Could Menstruate. And in this essay, she imagines a world um, where cis men menstruate. And by kind of flipping the switch, we really see how much shame is um, operating on this huge structural level. She says, do you want me to read a little bit from yeah, it? Yeah, if you can share, that would be great. Um, yeah, uh, it's a wonderful piece. Okay, so she says, what would happen if suddenly, magically, men could menstruate and women could not? Clearly, menstruation would become an enviable, boastworthy, masculine event. Men would brag about how long and how much. Young boys would talk about it as the envied beginning of manhood. Gifts, religious ceremonies, family dinners, and stag parties would mark the day. Sanitary supplies would be federally funded and free. Of course, some men would still pay for the prestige of such commercial brands as Paul Newman tampons, Muhammad Ali's rope dope pads, John Wayne maxi pads. Um, a couple more lines. Uh, radicals, male radicals would insist you must give blood for the revolution. Um, street guys would invent slang. He's a three pad man and get fives on the corner with exchanges like, man, you looking good. And of course, intellectuals would offer the most moral and logical arguments that without that biological gift for measuring the cycles of the moon and planets, how could a woman master any discipline that demanded a sense of time, space, mathematics, or the ability to measure anything at all? Um, so yes, by, by reframing it, and you know, she wrote um, this essay in the 70s, <laughs> and um, so much of, of this still feels like satire that rings true. Um, I think Gloria Steinem is also making the argument that shame operates as a way to keep people um, oppressed and in the dark, and um, it's, it's almost a, an engine of power and oppression, and so there's also um, a way that it's it's very critically important to understand shame and and how it's holding us back. Um, and this trickles into so many aspects of our lives, culturally, of course, but also um, in terms of our health and in terms of our access to the menstrual care products that everybody needs. Um, and there's, there's a lot more to say about that, but I do think that essay... Um, illuminate so much about shame, which can feel invisible. It feels like it's gravity, like it's um, just baked into our society, but it doesn't have to be that way. 
Right. And I have to say, I am sitting here wondering what John Wayne maxi pads would look like, to be <laughs> honest. <laughs> and, I, and I want to take this moment to also bring in uh, Michelle <laughs> Memran, who's a filmmaker from Middletown, Connecticut and uh, Brooklyn, New York. Uh, Michelle, I want to ask, you know, what, what's your reaction to that essay? What are some thoughts that was going through your mind as as uh, Rachel was reading it? Uh, hi, everyone. Hi, Rachel. Um, I, you know, I, I, too, was wondering about the John Wayne Mexicans, but I, I would, <laughs> I, I would love to see, you know, uh, gl- you know, to be able to describe my, you know, previously heavy flow as like the Gloria Steinem flow, or like to have like Queen Latifah tampons, you know, like yes. <laughs> that's um, that's that's what I would like to see. But yeah, and and just thinking about um, and what Rachel was talking about in terms of oppression and um gender and um shame and uh and the word sorry i've mm. been thinking a lot about lately and um and reading these essays again last night thinking about you know how many times i hear women say sorry over you know and um and i do, i too do that but how many times when i was having my period and leaking or the you know the stain on the mattress or the stain on my jeans saying oh god i'm so sorry i'm so sorry um and that's you know it's wild it's wild what we go through and how did rachel first approach you with this uh, idea of putting your story out there and what was your reaction Oh, well, I've, I've known uh, Rachel for a while. Um, and, and she, you know, reached out. Um, I've, I've long admired her work and her presence in the world. And she reached out, you know, within um, talking about uh, this new project and asking if anyone had stories. And I immediately was like, no, I don't have a story. <laughs> but here's like three sentences about my experience going through um early menopause, which is called, you know, chemo pause due to breast cancer treatment. And I started writing about it. And I, I think I just started writing about the first, my first period and this experience with my mother. And then Rachel said, I said, it's not a story. And then she said, that is the story. And then um, <laughs> encouraged me to write it out. And, uh, and yeah, it was a great, it was a great collaboration, actually, and a, and, and, and a really necessary healing thing to write about that I didn't even realize I needed to write about or talk about. So, Right. And I, and I think in your, your personal story, you had said your first thought was that death was near when you saw blood in your underwear. And I think that's a really <laughs> powerful moment. And so thinking back, you know, what feelings are, are you feeling now knowing that your first thought was fear and pain when you saw blood? Oh, you know, I mean, it's, I, I have a lot of sadness thinking about that, you know, and, and the fact that I didn't know anything mm-hmm. about my body. Um, I was a tomboy growing up and really didn't want to be a girl or, or know anything about what that meant or looked like. And I, and I think I purposefully tuned it out. And I also didn't have a family that was, you know, my, um, we didn't talk about things. Uh, there was a lot of denial on many levels. So um, when that happened, it was like, I think subconsciously, I didn't want to be a girl <laughs> and I didn't want to have a period, but I, but I also was like, what is happening in my body? And when I told my mom, when I, you know, I said, oh, there, there was blood in my, in my undies, as I say in the piece. And my mom was like, oh, it's, you know, it's, <laughs> it's probably hemorrhoids. It runs in the family. <laughs> and, um, and she handed me a tube of preparation H and that is wild, you know, but, um, but that's, you know, that's sort of the way I came into my period. Um, and it's very comical, you know, to, to write about it in that way. But it's actually quite sad, too, that I, I didn't have that relationship with my mother, that I knew what was what was to come. Or, you know, Rachel was mentioning sex education and the lack of, you know, just the lack of information and conversation and dialogue around these things. So, so yeah, so it's, I mean, I, I wrote a, a, a a fairly comical piece that, you know, I think is also girded with sadness, too. Right. And and I think I wonder if that resonates with people, right, because um, it's probably not as uncommon as you think when you think you're writing this for yourself. In fact, it's probably for a lot of people. And 
And it sounds like the experience might be a little bit more traumatic than most. But did you assign any sort of funny name to your period growing up? Oh, gosh, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. I don't think, I, you know, it was. Uh, no, I, I, I don't. Th- I mean, it was the. I mean, the the flood would would, you know, looking back, the deluge, um, you know, it, with partners over the years, because it ended up being becoming a very, very heavy situation, um, you know, an unusually like heavy flow. And I, I would, you know, work through, you know, s- several tampons a day and um, going back and forth to the gynecologist trying to figure out why there was, you know, my periods were so heavy. And so it was like, um, (laughs) yeah, I I didn't have, I didn't have a pet name for it. It was, um, it was the, the, you know, the dreaded, the dreaded, um, well, I guess people do call it the curse, right? So it it was a curse. Yeah. Well, and Rachel, you know, we, I think you talked a little bit about coded language for, for people who menstruate and, and have used in order to either keep their period secret or, you know, being able to talk about it in front of other people um, in a, you know, kind of a quote, quote, safe space. You know, did you have a pet name for your period or how did you, how did you communicate that? I mean, I think I'm a bit of um, an exception because I was inundated with these stories and so pretty quickly stopped feeling the need to code my own period. Um, but I've heard every nickname that there is from, yes, the curse um, to the painters are in to um, red pen. I mean, people will make up anything to avoid saying the dreaded word period menstruation. Um, and that's true even today from teens that I interviewed for this project. So that hasn't necessarily changed. Um, And yeah, I think it's, it's interesting to see how openness um, kind of ebbs and flows and isn't necessarily linear. And we're going to be continuing that with uh, Rachel Calder Nailbuff. She's the editor of Our Red Book and Michelle Menren is a filmmaker from Middletown, Connecticut. Coming up next, we are joined by a New Haven based immigration rights activist who will talk about how conversations about periods have changed. And you can also join the conversation. Find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. This is where we live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Catherine Shen. Getting your period could be a reason for a celebration, and it could also be a reason for shame. Here to talk about how different that experience is for people is Rachel Calder Nailbuff. She's the editor of Our Red Book, and Michelle Menran, who is a filmmaker from Middletown, and Kika Matos, who is a New Haven based immigration rights activist and organizer. Thanks for joining us today, Kika. Thank you for having me. Good morning. And I want to bring Rachel back real quick just to start us off. You know, you've talked to so many different people with a wide range of experience. And from that, how did you uncover period culture in a way that is tied to religion, spirituality, and culture? Sure. Um, well, I I want to say that periods are viewed as in some way, extremely powerful um, in almost every cultural tradition. Of course, in most, it's connected to some kind of shame. Um, So, you know, in the Jewish tradition, for example, um, women are considered ritually impure during their menstrual uh, during their menstrual cycle and sex is actually prohibited um the quran says that um menstruating women are a quote hurt and pollution so it's it's baked into um the judeo christian tradition that um menstruation is um is uh this sort of force of uncleanliness um, and impurity, though, of course, um, I think especially in more recent years, people have found kind of feminist approaches and reinterpretations of these ideas. And um, 
in a lot of these traditions, um, people who menstruate are actually told they can't pray, they can't even touch others. And um, but now people are finding a way of retreating almost as a kind of like feminist act, a time to rest, a time to commune with each other. So um, I think it's quite complex. Um, for other traditions um, outside of the Judeo-Christian tradition that I think are really important to highlight, especially because um, a lot of these traditions have been deliberately erased um, due to settler colonialism, um, especially in indigenous traditions, menstruation is viewed as extremely powerful um, and as a life source. And one contributor who is a Maori scholar um, wrote an essay for our Red Book about the ways that um, traditionally Maori communities um, would take care of whoever was menstruating so that they could rest and men would actually go and procure food and take care of the house um, so that women could be together and um, another contributor talks about menstruation as um, the source of, of life where we all come from. And um, so I think it's it's really important to understand that um, these sort of patriarchal views of menstruation aren't, um, aren't inevitable and actually that there is a history of, of, of an alternative. Um, and that's part of why it's really exciting to bring together um, almost a hundred voices from different cultural backgrounds to share their cultural traditions. When we're here to talk about the history and the information that we're getting and also about celebration, uh, but it also sounds like celebration of one's period really isn't the most common experience that people have. Um, do you think outside of societal shame or sexism that we've been talking about, is it a part of a legacy that's possibly uh, puritanical? I mean, I think especially <laughs> given that we're here in Connecticut and talking about CT Public Radio, um, Yes, I think that um, in the U.S., but surely in New England and <laughs> where where we feel the legacy of of um, puritanical history, um, talking about the body is extremely taboo and extremely uncomfortable. Um, and like a couple of us on this program have said, um, it it's sort of the default to grow up in a household where families don't talk about anything related to the body, even what's natural and happens every month. And, um, not only happens for teenagers and, um, is this event that is important to talk your teenager through, of course, but also for parents, parents often don't talk about what they're experiencing either. And so, um, we see the legacy of, of our puritanical history in the school system, of course, um, where we lack comprehensive sex education, but we also see it and feel it at home. Um, absolutely. And Kika, I want to bring you in because you grew up in a family where periods were a cause for celebration. Can you share what that experience was like? Of course. Um, so I am um, Puerto Rican and um, in Puerto Rico, when a young woman, a young person, um, uh, let me correct myself, a young person gets uh, their period. Uh, and, you know, uh, during the time when I got my period, it was much more gendered than today. So um, the the announcement would be uh, along the lines of using the word senorita. And so sometimes I, would, I, I come from a, a very large extended family. My mother has 11 uh, siblings. Uh, and so I remember when I was growing up, sometimes they would talk about uh, a young woman and they'd say, ella es señorita, she's a señorita. And I didn't really know what that meant um, until um, uh, my siblings and I were started getting our periods. And then I realized, oh, a se being a señorita means that, that you are now menstruating. Um, we had uh, a mandatory time uh, for family gatherings in my family, and that was dinner time. And it didn't matter what was going in our life, uh, going on in our lives. Uh, in my family, it was mandatory unless there was some urgency for all of us to sit down at dinner. And dinner was the time when we would share announcements and talk about what was going on. Uh, and I'm the youngest of four. 
So my two sisters had their periods before I did. And I remember at the dinner table, my mother saying, oh, Cruz, and Cruz uh, was my father. Cruz, I have big news. <laughs> and then she just said, you know, uh, Veronica es una señorita. And it, and it was just this moment of, wow, awe and celebration and congratulations. And she did the same thing with my middle sister, the same exact ritual. Cruz, tenemos noticias. We have this great news. Monica es una señorita. And I just thought, oh, this is just too much. I don't want a big announcement when I get my period. But in my family, when my siblings and I became, um, went through menstruation and we became, became so-called señoritas, it definitely was a moment of um, celebration. And going back to something Rachel said, you know, it is a marker of a person's reproductive power. Uh, and so I think very much the connotations um, in in Puerto Rico growing up, when you f refer to somebody as a señorita, it was also a signal of that reproductive power, right? That this young person at the time, señorita is a young woman, now has the ability to reproduce. So I actually, I so my sisters told my mother when they got their periods, I did not. And that was part of my story. I did not want her to make this announcement at the dinner table. That's just not my style. That's not how I roll. So when I got my period, I knew what it was because um, my mother had giant sanitary uh, napkins, giant boxes of sanitary napkins in her bathroom. So I always knew when she was menstruating because all of a sudden these giant Kotex boxes would show up in her bathroom. My sisters had already had um, their periods. And so there were sanitary napkins in the bathroom that we used. And so when I got my period, it was in the morning, I went to the bathroom, I saw that there was blood in my underwear. And very matter of factly, I changed my underwear, I put on a sanitary napkin, and I went to school. Uh, and my mother only found out when she asked me at some point in she, time, she said, you know, you should be right about now getting your period. And I said, Oh, I already got my period. And I changed the subject. <laughs> Well, it sounds like that's a roller coaster ride, really, in emotions, which I think a lot of people go through when they start menstruating. And you, in fact, became very calm uh, when your moment came. And with with that story and with the experiences of your sisters, you know, how and your own, how did that influence you into adulthood and the way you view periods today? Yeah, I, you know, I, I would say I've always been very matter of fact about periods. I've never really had much of an emotional um, attachment. I, um, I was a, a high school jock. I was very much into athletics. I swam competitively. I played basketball. I played volleyball. You name it. I played so many sports. Um, and so periods for me were just a, a kind of an inconvenience, right? When I got, and, and I will say part of the story in my book and part of my own narrative, the thing that was most powerful for me um, wasn't getting my period, it was being able to use tampons. Um, why? And this is part of, of uh, a generational um, issue in Puerto Rican, and I will say Latina culture, and that is that um, my mother grew up believing that one of the things that her daughters uh, needed to be were, uh, were virgins when they got married. Um, and the idea of using tampons for her was, 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 a, was just completely taboo, unacceptable. Um, she bought us sanitary napkins. Why? Um, and this is going to sound very um, aged, but it, it, it is definitely part of my experience growing up. Um, if you wore a tampon, the theory went that your hymen would be um, uh, uh, broken or impacted. And we know that part of the, the, the lore and the stories of virginity is, did, you know, does a young woman um, bleed when she first has sex? And so my mother didn't want us to wear tampons because she wanted us to be virgins and she didn't want to be for there to be any doubt that her daughters, when they got married, were virgins. And I thought that was just utter nonsense. I mean, I think I was a feminist from the day I was born. And I remember being really upset every time I got my period and I had to swim because I couldn't swim because I had my period. 
And it was embarrassed. And that was where the, the shame and humiliation came in for me, that I was embarrassed and ashamed when I couldn't swim. And so, you know, at the, at the, the, the dinner table at some point in time, um, I don't know how the conversation uh, came up, but, but I argued for us being able to use tampons. Uh, and my sisters backed me up. And then we started having this conversation with my mother about how ridiculous it was that her views were old fashioned uh, and that we should be able to use tampons. And I remember she looked at my dad and my dad spoke up and he said, I think they're absolutely right. I think they should have um, access to tampons. And that to me, when we talk about the emotion, that was the celebration for me. I thought, oh, praise the Lord Jesus. I now get to wear tampons. I can play sport. I can swim. Um, but my my own relationship with periods has just been very matter of fact. I get my period. Okay, well, I have to make sure that I have tampons at home and I have sanitary napkins. And it's that time of the month when it's a it's a it's a, it's an inconvenience. It's you know it's a slight inconvenience. What I'm taking out from this is to keep products around and keep on swimming is what you're telling me to do. <laughs> That's <laughs> exactly right. You've been and I joke around. I, I will say when I travel, I joke around with uh, my friends that I'm that person who always carries tampons, chocolates, and Advil. That sounds like the perfect emergency kit, in my opinion. <laughs> You've been listening to Kika Makos, who is a New Haven-based immigration rights activist and organizer, as well as Rachel calder Nailbuff. She's the editor of Our Red Book. Coming up next, our guests will stay with us to talk more about their stories, as well as Axel Gay, who is a trans teenager from Shelton, Connecticut, who will be joining us to share his story with us. Stay tuned. This is Where We Live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Catherine Shen. We're back with Rachel calder Nailbuff, who's the editor of Our Red Book. We've been talking about how conversations about periods have evolved through time and what more can be done to continue normalizing those conversations. And here to help us with that is Axel Gay. He's a trans teen from Shelton, Connecticut, that met Rachel through his creative writing class. Axel, welcome to the show. Hello, it's great to be here. And also still with us is Kika Matos, who is a New Haven-based immigration rights activist, and Michelle Menran, who is a filmmaker from Middletown, Connecticut. Um, Axel, I want to start with you. You know, Tell us, how did you become um, to be a contributor for the book? So I went to an art high school, and I majored in creative writing. And at the time, I was a junior when I met Rachel, and she came into my creative writing classroom, invited by my teacher, Miss Inglart. Um, and she told us the story that she told in the beginning of the show. Um, and it really touched me to hear such a such a deep and telling um, thing about something that I wasn't really comfortable being so intimate and vulnerable with. So I got to I got to meet her when I was 16. Um, I was in I was in a Zoom meeting because COVID was still uh, raging. <laughs> and I I got to write a story about something I wasn't really comfortable with yet. And Rachel kind of helped me on the journey to being more comfortable with the fact that I meant. Well, and once you realize that this very vulnerable and personal story of yours was going to be published. You know, how did you feel? What what went through your mind when you realized that that was happening? You know, when I wrote this story initially, I thought nobody would see it. I thought it was just going to be between me and Rachel. And I wasn't really mentally on the same page that, wow, I was going to be heard and seen by many people. And to to have that, to have like my mom read this story and to know that there could be other people who were like me who didn't really have anybody to like, you know, relate to when I was dealing with this, it, it meant a lot. It really did. It was like this, this moment of, I got to do the thing that not a lot of people like me got to do. And I got to share that piece of myself with other people. And we could it was, have seen 
No, go for it. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I was just going to say it was it was just a it was just a really great moment for me. And I was just going to say, because we did talk about a little bit of that uh, earlier where, you know, you thought you were writing this for yourself. But in fact, many people would resonate with your story. And and actually, you know, you talked about comparing your body to other girls around you that were the same age. Where did the pressure to draw those comparisons come from? You know, a lot of it came from my upbringing. Um, my mom was always very into kind of nitpicking how she was coming across to other people. She was a very clean person. Our house was always clean. Everything was always perfect. So I guess she accidentally kind of implemented onto me that that's kind of the, that's kind of the standard, like trying to be perfect and everything like that. So in my mind, that was looking at what everybody else was doing and trying my best to kind of do my own version of, what everybody else was doing. <laughs> well, I want to thank you so much for sharing your story with us. And Rachel, I want to touch on this real quick. You know, Axel sharing, you know, his story, one of many. And in your conversations with other teenage contributors, what did you uncover about the American public education system's approach to period culture and history? Um, oh, there's so much there. And first, Axel, I just want to say thank you. I was so moved hearing you reflect on your experience. And I, I think that for almost every story, it is a hugely generous act for these writers, artists, teens, activists to share their very vulnerable accounts. And almost everybody did it in that same spirit of um, here's a story I wish I had heard, um, but that I experienced alone and that I want to share with others. Um, so thank you. And I've heard from so many readers who've read your account um, that it's been, it's, it's offered solace. It's opened their eyes. Um, yeah, there's, there's a line from Axel's story that I think about all the time, which is, um, you know, if you're, Axel talks about as, as a trans teen, um, his first period felt like a gavel slamming down, um, deeming him to be a woman, inevitable and irreversible. And so I think just this idea that for a lot of people, and even Michelle and Kika referenced this too, like for people who have relationships to gender um, that are not necessary, and, and womanhood and femininity that are not inherently positive, um, a period isn't inherently positive. And of course, um, for many, it's a cause for celebration, but for others, it can be a source of dread. And um, that's one thing that is essential for our education system to talk about when we talk about periods is that everybody has a different response. Everybody is allowed to have a different emotional response to menstruation. Um, but of course, the main issue is that it's not talked about enough um, or at all for um, sometimes half the classroom. And of course, um, also young people are getting their period earlier and earlier. And so for many reasons, it doesn't really make sense to wait until puberty to have the period talk in schools. I think that's another through line that's come through pretty clearly from the book that almost no one is prepared for when they get their first period. No one, even even teens today. And so some of that um, is um, kind of an indictment on sex education and when we teach kids about periods. But some of that is also cultural and it it makes me wonder, um, what if schools and what if we culturally just started talking about menstruation from a much earlier age? Um, it sounds like, um, you know, in Kika's household, things were more open. There were pads around. It was maybe talked about a little bit more, um, but that's not necessarily true of every family. And so at least for the school system, um, my hope is that we could talk about menstruation in health class earlier on, of course, but also whenever it's relevant, it should be something that gym teachers feel comfortable talking about, that history teachers are talking about. Um, as I shared at the top of the hour, the story that prompted this book is a story that takes place during the Holocaust and is a story that I think helped me understand. My, my great aunt, for those of you who weren't listening, at the time got her first period while fleeing Nazi-occupied Poland and um, her story helped me understand that history. And so I think there's also an argument to be made that these stories are a part of our 
of our histories are a part of our understanding of where we come from. And so we should be talking about menstruation um, in all subject areas because it's, it's connected to all parts of our lives. We only have a couple minutes left, but I do want to give everyone a chance to respond. You know, how did our red book change the way you view conversations about our bodies and bleeding? We'll start with Michelle. It complete. I mean, it's it's a conversation that um, reveal for me that reveals um, it, it, the the layers of just complexity and range. Um, I've never seen anything like it. And so it's also making me think about the layers and complexity of my own story. And I'm actually visiting my mother in Michigan right now. And I'm, and I don't know her period story. So that's the first thing I'm going to do tonight. So, (laughs) so this is giving me a, a, an activity for the day. So thank you all. I love that so much. Uh, Kika, how did uh, our red book change the way you view conversations about bleeding? As an organizer, I immediately thought about the power of this tribe, right? This tribe of people who menstruate and all of us have these stories that, and what the beauty and the power could be if we move forward in the spirit of organizing and sharing stories in a way that holds up all of the people uh, who menstruate. Axel? Every time I let someone hear what I have to say, I was seen by everyone I was able to touch and people who I never thought that I'd be able to reach. It was just incredible. And we got about a minute, but Rachel, I would love to ask, you know, what are your hopes that this book can do for people? I mean, I think what you said at the top of the segment that there's this amazing energy and Kika just touched on this too, that you feel when you receive these accounts. And so no matter your gender, no matter your age. I hope that by listening to these stories, we're invited to go to that vulnerable place together. um, And that these stories are invitations to reach out, to make connections in our own families, um, in partnerships. And um, that by reading or even listening to some of these stories, you're inspired to do <laughs> some of what Michelle is thinking about, asking asking people in your own circle for their stories. Um, and just from an artistic and cultural standpoint, I, I, I strongly believe that reading these accounts, listening to these accounts teaches us that these are some of the greatest stories we have, some of the greatest stories that are never told and that hopefully that will change. Well, this has been a very inspiring Friday. I want to thank everyone for joining us and sharing your stories with everyone. Uh, You've been listening to Rachel Calder Nailbuff, who's the editor of Our Red Book, and Axel Gay. He's a trans teenager from Shelton, Connecticut. Thank you both for sharing your story with us. We also had Kika Matos, who is a New Haven based immigration rights activist, and Michelle Memram, who is a filmmaker from Middletown. I'm Catherine Shen. Today's show is produced by Anya Gradalski. Our technical producer is Kat Pastor. Download where we live anytime on your favorite podcast app. And thank you so much for listening.